Today I'd like to just talk to you about why it is so crucial, why it is so important uh, to have the church and to be part of the church. Uh, what do you miss when you miss church? I put a little title on my sermon. Uh, sometimes I'll advertise something on the Facebook page just to try and get people engaged a little bit. And I think I said, can you be saved without going to church? Well, I'm not going to answer that just now. Hopefully you know the answer when we uh, get deeper into the message here. You know, I was fascinated a few years ago to hear about a problem that um, has been taking place not only in North America but other parts of the world with honeybees. It's called CCD, Colony Collapse Disorder. And they were trying to figure out why so many of the bees were dying, principally in the winter, just whole hives were just dying off in mass. There are whole communities and, and territories where all the bees were dying. I think Albert Einstein said years ago that if all the honeybees in the world should die, civilization would have 10 years. That's probably a loose quote. But he was just recognizing how important honeybees are to humanity. You realize that bees are the pollinators for one third of the plants that you eat. And especially here in California, uh, you know, there are beekeepers, their full-time job is to take their bees. I know f friends that do this from one fruit orchard to another. They do it uh, at different seasons when the flowers are in bloom. They said if the bees don't come, there's no harvest. Well, U.S. beekeepers lost 40% of their honey colonies in 2019. Didn't hear that in the news because it was full of other things. That's pretty serious. 40% of their hives, 4 in 10 hives died. And it's not just North America but around the world. Colony collapse disorder. Unfortunately, it's not just the bees. You know, God has placed the church in the world to make life a little sweeter. And there's another kind of colony collapse disorder in North America and other parts of the world with Christians in their commitment to church. Mainline Protestant churches are experiencing a severe decline in attendance. I've got a few statistics for you here. According to a report by Lifeway Christian Resources, approximately 100 churches close their doors in North America every week. Nearly three out of five young Christians, 59% disconnect from church life after age 15. Some permanently, that's from the Barna research. 150,000 people leave churches for good every week. Southern Baptists are now, and they're the largest Protestant denomination in North America, they're now down to their lowest level in uh, 30 years. In 2002, they had over 16 million members. They're now down to 14 million members. And of those 14 million members, only 4,500,000 go to church. Evangelical Lutheran Church had a membership of 4,542,000. That's probably about cut in half now. And their attendance is about 28%. U.S. church membership was, uh, all of the Americans, about 70% of Americans were Christians that attended church from 1937 through till about 1976. Pretty consistent. 70% of Americans were churchgoers during that time. It dropped a little bit, about 2% in the 70s, but from 1990 to the present, church attendance in North America has dropped 20% during that time. There is a colony collapse disorder. There's a number of reasons for that, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. So what are the principal reasons that people stop going to church? There's been a lot of groups that have done surveys on this, but what are some of the reasons that people stop attending? I've got about a dozen here. One, peer pressure. Their friends aren't going, and, or maybe they're being teased for doing it. Distracted by the busyness of life, 19%. Say, I just got so busy. Conflict with another member. They say, well, the church was run by a clique and they had some run-in. About 12% had some problem with somebody or some group. They felt they failed to live up to the standards and they felt guilty or uncomfortable. 
Others, maybe only about 10%, had doctrinal doubts. You know, we think people stop going because of doctrine. Very few is that the reason. Maybe it's uh, family home responsibilities prevented attendance. They just felt they were too busy. 17% so that church members seemed hypocritical or judgmental. Have you heard that one before? That's 34%. By the way, the percentages I'm giving you, don't take them too seriously. I looked them over and I realized that adds up to more than 100%, so something's wrong with my numbers. I took several different surveys and put them together, and I guess I should have stuck with one. Work situation prevented church attendance. They moved too far from the church, 17%. They said the church was not relevant or helping them to develop spiritually in practical ways. And then others, they stop believing in organized religion, which of course means they believe in disorganized religion. <laughs> and then others, they got divorced or separated and they felt a little bit isolated or maybe their spouse continued to go in church and sometimes church members take sides in these things and, and it made it very uncomfortable them, to them. Now, these are some of the reasons people stop going to church. There's others, a lot I could mention that are not in the list here, but let me establish something right here at the beginning. We're involved in a church building program, but the church building program is not the building. The church building program is building people. You are the church. When church is over and we leave this building, you have not left the church unless you have an out-of-body experience because you are the church. We are are the church. Together, we are living stones. The church is the people, the buildings. We do have designated places where we come together to worship, but uh, some churches meet outdoors. You can meet in a cave and it can be a church. And so, uh, just want to make that clear. So, we're not talking about the importance of coming to a particular building. So, what is a church? It comes from, when we say church in English, that's really a derivative of the word kirk. It's a Scottish word, word and that's deriv derived from the biblical word ecclesia. And um, it, you've heard of ecclesiastical. This is a group that is called out, a meeting, a congregation, an assembly, a community of faith. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 10 verse 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hence this sermon. Do you see the day approaching? Yes. Speaking of the day of the Lord. And if you see the day of the Lord approaching, we should encourage and exhort and stir up one another not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, because you miss a lot when you miss church. It is crucial for us to grow and to be healthy as Christians that we stick together. You know, bees by themselves don't produce any honey. And for us to do the work God calls us to do, we are all different parts of one body and you need to stick together. You know, uh, it's perfectly normal if you turn to the person next to you and you notice they have a nose on their face. You don't have to look right now to check, but I'm almost sure that everybody today has a nose. And you'd think it was odd if you pointed at someone and said, look, a nose. Because you'd expect to see the nose on the face. But if you point on the floor, it is, oh, look, a nose. That would be creepy, right? <laughs> and that nose is not going to live long on the floor. Well, in the same way, if you say, I'm a Christian, but I'm by myself, I'm separated from the body, you're not going to last long. You're meant to be attached. And we all have our different gifts. And we all need to be together. And um, it hurts the work of God in the world when we do not come together and we should be encouraged and exhorted to do that. And not only that, it hurts you. So what do you miss when you miss the church? I'd like to go through about a dozen different things that the Bible teaches in this uh, department. First of all, if you look in, you miss the presence of God is one thing. Look in John chapter 20 verse 19. This is talking about when Christ rose from the dead. That night there, the disciples had gathered in that upper room uh, for fear of the Jews, and the doors were shut. And it says, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them 
And he said, peace to you. They were gathered together, and he came and revealed his presence to them. You know, Jesus tells us, Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. That becomes the church. Do you know, you can have a church gathering. It may not be on Sabbath. It doesn't have to be Sabbath. We're having meetings many different nights of the week there in Folsom, and God's people are gathered. That's his church. We have a Tuesday night Bible study over at, now we're at the New Amazing Facts Worship Room. If you haven't heard that, that's the church. And when we gather in his name, what does he say? I am there. Think about that. How, how often we've missed the presence of God because we are separating from the church. Revelation 21 verse 3, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. Notice, with them, with them, with them, and be their God. Sin has separated us from God. God wants to be restored in relationship with us. And part of this is taking place in the church. When we gather in his name, he reveals himself to us. Now you might be thinking, Pastor Doug, doesn't the Bible say there's nowhere, Psalm 139 verse 7, nowhere I can flee from his presence. That's right, God's everywhere. But God reveals himself in certain situations in a very dramatic way. And one of the ways he promises is when you gather in my name, two or three, I am there. Karen and I went to a, um, uh, an NRB meeting, that's National Religious Broadcasters. We go almost every year. And uh, when we arrived early, we had a special invitation to be part of a meet and greet. And they do this every year. Usually they bring in some representative from Washington to talk about religious liberty. And that's part of the reason we go. And, and we had traveled that day and we thought, oh, I don't know if I want to go to the meet and greet. You know, they usually bring in some congressman or some, some lobbyist or somebody to talk about what's going on. And, and uh, so we took our time and we just went to eat on our own. And... And when we got there, we said, oh, the meet and greet's probably almost over, and it wasn't, and we waited around. Finally, um, we discovered that the meet and greet was with the vice president. And we, Karen wanted to go. I said, oh, yeah, she's, she's, yeah, that's right. <laughs> we did get to say hi and shake his hand, but we could have just hung out with him and talked to him and asked him questions. And so we missed a meet and greet with the vice president because we were, uh, indifferent, you might say, to the opportunity. How many times have we missed the presence of the Creator because we've missed church? God wants us to have that experience. Another thing you miss if you miss church, you miss the power of God. John chapter 20, verse 22, when he met with them there in the upper room, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And you read in Acts 1, verse 4 and 5, being assembled together, again, they're in the upper room, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized you with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, they stayed in that upper room for 10 days. That was a long church service. You think if I go past 1230, it's a long service. They stayed 10 days. <laughs> Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Would you like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You know when it happened? When they were gathered as a church. 120 of them in an upper room praying. Suddenly there came the sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues of fire and sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, what qualified them to be filled with the Holy Spirit was, yes, they needed to pray. And yes, they needed to believe. And they needed to be there. They needed to show up. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't it be sad to say, well, that was the day I slept in. When the Holy Spirit was poured out. Some people miss the power of God. You know, I, uh, I go to Harbor Freight Tools every now and then. Any of you men? For those watching, that's a, a, an area, kind of a hardware store that they, they got. It's mostly Chinese tools. But uh, they got great deals. And uh, 
Here in California, in case you haven't heard, uh, since we had the terrible Paradise Fire, the power company is afraid to have the power on when it's too windy and it's dry out. And so now, you know, our, our in the summertime, if it's dry and the wind starts to blow, we turn into a third world country and the power goes off. <laughs> and for once, the weatherman said, we're expecting high winds and dry conditions, so you may have your power turned off. And this was around Columbus Day. Some of you may remember. Well, it turns out that Harbor Freight Tools was advertising. It had already been arranged that they were having a generator sale. <laughs> they didn't know what the weather was, but they'd already printed their sale flyers. They were having a generator sale. And uh, when the weather came out and said, you may lose power for several days in Northern California. And you know, that's kind of inconvenient when you just have no electricity. That uh, when they opened up for their Columbus Day sale, they had a line going a mile long. That's an exaggeration in case you didn't know. They had a big line. I went to Harbor Freight Tool because they had, you know, they give away a free flashlight no matter what you buy. <laughs> and I wanted the free flashlight. I got the house right now. It's full of free flashlights. You can ask Karen. <laughs> so I, just, I went there and I saw the line. I said, forget it. I think I'm going to have to live without my free flashlight. But, and I talked to the proprietor there. I said, uh, I, I totally... <laughs> We still had our power, so I wasn't thinking. I said, what's going on? He said, generators. He says, these people, they're going to have no power. And he says, we're selling all our extension cords. We're selling all our generators. We got another ship coming in from China. He said, we've ordered extra. And he said, we're running out. And the people who came too late, they were out of power, out of electricity, weeping, gnashing of teeth, melted ice cream. <laughs> because they didn't show up. They didn't have the power. How sad that God uh, wants to give us that power. When there's something that happens when we come together. There's a power that we get when we gather for church. I think one reason that God wants us to come every week is not only to rest, but you know what's happening when you're resting? You're building your power. You're gathering strength. You're recovering. Something else you miss when you miss church is you miss the pardon of God. Have you noticed how many times people were gathered together in the name of the Lord, in the presence of the Lord, in the house of the Lord, and they were forgiven by the Lord? John chapter 8, this woman is brought to the temple, and there she's being accused, and they want to stone her, and Jesus declares to her, neither do I condemn you. Loose translation, I forgive you, go and sin no more. That happened in the house of God. She received forgiveness. Maybe you remember reading in Mark chapter 2. This man is brought to the house where Jesus is. He's teaching and preaching and there's so many people gathered together. They can't get through the door. They can't get through the window. And they're bringing their crippled friend to Jesus. Now everyone thinks his problem is his paralysis. For him his biggest problem was his sin. But they are so determined to get him into the church they take the tiles off the roof and they lower their friend into the presence of the Lord through the roof. And Jesus says to him, son, your sins are forgiven. I mean, that's what he really wanted. He was glad he went to church that day. He, of course, got healing as well. And uh, not only there, you look in John 7, 48. The woman who was in that gathering, it was a dinner, but Jesus was there. He was teaching the word. She's washing his feet, and Simon starts to gossip about her. Well, that would be reason to stop going to church, right? Because there's hypocrites in the church. But what happened to that woman that day? Jesus said, woman, your sins are forgiven. Even though there was a Judas at the dinner that day, and even though Simon was judging her, she was glad she went that day because Jesus forgave her sins. That's a really, really important lesson. That's kind of like churches today. There was that dinner full of imperfect people that misjudged her motives. But Jesus read her heart, and because she came with the right attitude, she received mercy in spite of the problems everyone else had. Are you with me? Some people miss church, and they miss pardon. You know, without pardon, we don't get to heaven. So how important is church? Now, Again, being in church, we're not saved by works. The most important thing that saves us is acceptance of Jesus. 
But you are a whole lot more likely to learn about and accept Jesus when you're in a church where the truth is being proclaimed. And keep this in mind. The church is the object on earth upon which Jesus bestows his supreme regard. It is his bride. The Bible says it is his body. When God Almighty looks down on earth, there is no organization, there is no group as imperfect as it is on earth on which he has higher regard than for the church. He died, he bled, he gave his life to save the people that will be in the church. Only those that are part of his body are going to heaven. When you're baptized, you are baptized in Christ. You're brought into the body of Christ and this motley crew of people you see around the world, I'm not just talking about you, it's like the apostles, it's like the people who followed David, it says everybody who was in distress and everybody who was angry and everybody who was in debt, they all followed David, he became a captain over them. It's like a motley crew, the apostles. I said the uneducated shepherds and fishermen and tax collectors and he turned them into a powerful force to transform the world. That was his church. God still does it today. And it is so important for us to say I want to be part of that. If we are flippant and indifferent about what it means to come to church, it's saying what you think of Jesus. It's, it's, it says something about what you think about what he loves the most. He gave his life to save those who will be in his church. And when you say, eh, the church, that's a statement about Christ. This is what you call exhortation. <laughs> that we do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. What do you miss when you miss church? You miss the people of God. Amen. And flawed though they may be, and we, everyone talks about the hypocrites in the church, and we talk about people that are not genuinely converted. But let me just say a word. There's a whole lot of good people in church too. Uh, the reason the bad ones stand out is because they're surrounded by so many good ones. <laughs> you ever heard the expression, one gunshot is heard more than a thousand prayers. Everybody's going to notice the bad thing that happens. Everyone will remember the dastardly thing that Judas did. But there's also some really good people in the church. And you heard me also say before, you don't see too many hospitals called First Atheist Hospital. It's, yeah, you'll have Methodist, you'll have First Baptist, you'll have Seventh-day Adventist, you'll have Catholic hospitals. It's people who believe that build the orphanages and the hospitals and do all these things. There's a lot of good that is done by the church, but the devil gets us to focus on the hypocrites and the negative. You miss a lot of good people when you miss church. Psalm 133 verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You know, four times in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, when you come together, when you come together, he's talking about the communion service, he never says, if you come together. He says, when you come together, it is an understood, self-evident truth that if you're a Christian, we are going to come together. We are not going to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Leviticus 23, 3, six days shall your work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath, a solemn rest, a holy convocation. Now what is a convocation? Convocation is when you convene, you assemble, you come together. This is a convocation. Some people say, oh, Pastor Doug, I believe the Sabbath, but I don't think you need to go to church. Uh, now that's true. There are some people that are sick and they can't go. And uh, maybe some are too far away and they can't go. There's no church within a reasonable traveling distance. Now, what that distance is sometimes depends on how bad you want to go. Some people say, I can't go to church because of the weather. It never stops them from going fishing. <laughs> but a little rain might stop them from going to church. But I found if you want to go, some people, I know folks that have driven here and they've gone two hours each way because they wanted to come. People are able to do what they want to do. Amen. Sabbath is called a holy convocation. Part of Sabbath keeping is convening. And again, there may be times where a person is sick, they're shut in, they just, no way they can do it and God understands. And we praise the Lord that we're able to stream our service to so many people that don't have an alternative. Amen? Amen. 
That's where you should see the letters. People really appreciate that they're able to join us through media. Some people use media as an excuse not to go. And they say, oh, I'll just stay home. I don't have to change. I can watch church in my pajamas. <laughs> and you're missing something. God wants us to come together. It's called a holy convocation. It's a holy convocation, the Sabbath. So part of Sabbath keeping is coming together. Ephesians 2 verse 19. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. We are living part of a household. You cannot live successfully as a Christian in spiritual isolation. We need to come together. You know something? You have a tendency to become, take it from a hermit. You can become eccentric when you live by yourself. If you don't have other people to bounce your ideas off of, you start talking funny. You start thinking funny. And if you don't know it, people that stay at home and just surf the internet come up with the craziest ideas about life. If that's all you're doing, and you can just get a little eccentric. You need other people to say, brother, sister, you're talking crazy, stop it. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> The government is not trying to destroy us with chemtrails in the sky. Now someone's going to write me letters about that. <laughs> That's right. And you start getting off balance. We tend to balance each other. You can get rough edges when you live by yourself and you rub with other people. It sort of polishes things a little bit. We need each other. Now, otherwise you become a little socially retarded when you isolate yourself. It's true. Amen? We need the people of God. The Bible tells us that Ephesians 2.21, whom the whole building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are being built together for a dwelling place of God. We are built together. 1 Peter 2 verse 4, coming to him as a living stone rejected indeed by men but chosen by God in precious, you are as living stones built up. We are you and I are all bricks all laid one on top of the other into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes we run away because we have trouble getting along with people. And it's not people, it's usually us. Again, take it from an expert. But the Bible tells us that uh, if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to love one another. You know, it's really easy to love you when I'm not around you. It becomes more challenging to love people when you're with them. One reason we go to church is because we have love problems. We have problems loving God and loving each other. And the Bible tells us the way that we show our love for God is by loving each other. We accept God's forgiveness and we pass it on by forgiving each other. If I'm never around you, I don't get a chance to forgive you. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> As we interact with people, flawed people, it strengthens our love muscles. You know, I've got a list here of 20 times Paul says in the New Testament, one another, one another. I'm not going to read them all. We're to love one another, serve one another. And you want the verses, Ephesians 4.32. We're to greet one another, 1 Corinthians 16.20. No, I'm not going to read all the verses. You look them up. We're to bear one another's burdens. We're to be hospitable to one another. We're to teach and admonish one another. We're to comfort one another. We're to edify one another. We're to submit to one another. We're to fellowship with one another. We're to forbear one another. We're to have compassion on one another. Be tenderhearted to one another. Confess our faults to one another. Pray for one another. Do not lie to one another. To exhort one another. To care for one another. I did read them all, didn't I? How do you do that by yourself? You, you've got to come to church. We need a commitment about coming to church. It, it is so crucial to our spiritual growth. It is so foundational to Christian teaching. It is mystifying to me how people say, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. That's like saying, I'm a fish, but I don't go to the water. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. I'm a politician, but I have no constituents. I'm a soldier, but I have no army. My name's Rambo. I'm out by myself <laughs> doing my own thing. These, these maverick Christians, it's just not healthy. What do you miss when you miss church? You miss the purpose of God. Mark 16, 14, 
Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. He rebuked them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He had given them a purpose. Acts 1-4, being assembled together with them. They're assembled. And he gives them their mission marching orders. He said, you are to wait in Jerusalem for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then again, you'll be my witnesses. Go into all the world. You know, uh, if you fly the most expensive American fighter jet is called the uh, Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor. You're flying a very expensive piece of equipment. It's amazing that they'll get these young guys that are, you know, 23 years old and they'll put them in a plane that costs $334 million. Uh, and you've paid for that plane. Before that plane goes on a mission, they bring all the pilots together for a mission briefing. And can you picture a young man who's been trained as a pilot to fly a $334 million super fighter jet. He shows up late for the mission briefing. And as everyone's leaving on the mission, he says, so where are we going? What are we doing? What am I shooting at? And you think, you kidding, you missed the briefing? Most important mission in the world is the one that Jesus gives to you and me. We've, there's a battle out there. We've got a battle with a terrible enemy. And fortunately, we've got a great commander. But we're given marching orders, and he gives us instructions. And for us to be lackadaisical and, and indifferent and flippant about what are your orders, Lord? What is your will? What do you want us to do? And say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I don't really care what my Lord wants. I don't know what his orders are. I missed his orders this morning. But um, there's just something that is incongruous about that attitude for a Christian. Point number six, what do you miss when you miss church? You miss the praise of God. John 20, 20. He, reveal, he revealed himself to them in the upper room. He showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. They were praising God. They were smiling. Psalm 122 verse 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Got to repeat that to our teenagers. Say, we're going to church. Uh oh. Special meeting tonight. I'm not again. I know one uh, friend of mine that his wife would tell the kids, we've got to go to church. And he would correct her and say, no, we get to go to church. <laughs> it's a privilege. It's not like I got to go. I get to go. I was glad when I said, I'm going to the house of the Lord. Amen. You don't want to miss the praise of God. Jesus appears in the upper room, Matthew 28, verse 9, and he says, rejoice. Christ said, rejoice. There's to be praise in our gatherings. Amen. Should be encouraging. Psalm 95, verse 2, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. When you miss church, you miss the praising of God. Now, I'll tell you, some of you are in the same boat as me. That As I get older, I use too many chainsaws and heavy equipment. My hearing is slowly going. And I'm okay if it's, you know, you and me in a room. But if I get in a restaurant or if I'm in the lobby and there's a bunch of voices around me and you're talking to me. I just want to make a confession. Sometimes I'll smile. I'll agree with whatever you're saying. I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> I go, yes, yes, ah, amen, yeah. And, and I try to hide it, you know. I act like I know what you're saying. I'm sorry, but sometimes I just, I, otherwise I have to keep saying, what? And I don't want to wear a hearing aid yet. <laughs> the day will come. And so, you know, I'm just trying to hold out as long as I can and be as polite as I can. But you know what really aggravates me is when I see people laughing, I go, what? What did you say? I don't want to miss that. You're all happy. What made you so happy? Tell me why you're laughing. You know what I'm talking about? If you're all arguing and gossiping, I don't care. I'll just say, yes, you know. <laughs> but then I hear someone they're laughing. I'm going, what do you say? <laughs> Play it back again. <laughs> I don't want to miss the praise. Some people miss church. They miss the praise. You know, I'll throw in another little amazing fact because I think it's relevant. Uh, not only is there a colony collapse disorder going on, do you realize that there is a retail mall apocalypse? 
that in North America, malls are closing. Retails have announced, now some of you, first time sermon, I got your attention. <laughs> Till now, you're just, then I said the malls are closing. You're sitting up right now. Yeah. <laughs> Retailers have announced more than 8,600 closings so far in 2019. According to Credit Suisse, between 20 to 25 percent of malls will close by 2022 in two years. That's staggering when you think about it. Some of it's because some of the big retailers like Macy's, Sears, and others are, are closing, and all the small shops that depend on the foot traffic, they just can't stay open. There's just no customers. And uh, you know what part of that is from is you've got a few big box stores like Walmart and Costco and Amazon. People are shopping at home. The Internet's great. I mean, there's a lot of things I really appreciate about the internet. When I use these big old concordances, you know, bless their hearts over at the uh, Folsom meetings as a gift, they're giving people a concordance for coming. I think, well, if you want to carry that thing around, that's good for you. You're going to get a big old, it looks like a bag of cement, big Young's concordance. And I remember using one of those, but now you just click, type those words in on your phone, on your iPad, on your computer. I can search so quickly. I, the Internet's great. Social media for communicating, it's, it's nice. But some people it becomes a crutch. And they kind of get in their own little world all the time. And they just, you know, it's like they become disconnected from other humans because they're just all the time looking at their phone. You ever seen people walk out across the street and they're like this? And you think, how do they even know? Hope the peripheral vision is good. And more and more people are staying home. And they're doing everything on their devices. And we're losing the interconnectivity of human relationships. Because everybody's, you know, I emailed Karen from my office to her office 50 feet away. <laughs> Anyone else text their spouse when they were, you know, just sitting a few... So the, the digital technology is not just affecting merchandising, it's affecting worship. And that's one of the reasons some people are not going to church. They're doing it at home. Or they're trying to find righteousness via text. Or righteousness via Facebook. Or YouTube. And you can also find unrighteousness through that too. What do you miss when you miss church? You miss the proclamation of God. Acts 4.31 when they prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. You got the power of God there again, but what happened? And they spoke the word of God with boldness. They had gathered together, they prayed, and the word of God was proclaimed with boldness, and people's hearts were touched and changed because they were there. We miss that. You know, I remember um, reading something I thought was interesting. Uh, among the ancient American Indians, especially in the plains, fleetness of foot was highly prized. It was really important if you were a young brave that you could run fast. You used to have to often chase down your, your prey. And so the elders would tell these young bucks, they say the secret to being fast on your feet is you have to rub the dust of butterfly wings on your heart. So they believe the elders and they would run all over the meadows catching these butterflies so they could rub the powder from the butterfly wings on their hearts. The elders would go back to the teepee and they'd laugh and they'd know it had nothing to do with butterfly wings. What it had to do with was their running to catch the butterflies made them very fast. They thought, look how much butterfly dust I have. I must be fast. It's because you were able to chase them all down. Well, you know, it's something like that also in church. It's through the Bible study in the church through uh, living with the different people, learning to love the different people, listening to the proclamation of the word, we are learning how to reach people outside the church. You say, how can I do the mission of God? Part of what's happening in the church is preparing you to reach those outside the church. Something else you miss when you miss church? You miss the protection of God. You know the story of the Exodus, angel of death, went through the land. By the way, that's going to happen again someday. There's going to be seven last plagues. The Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood on the lentil and on the doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door 
and not allow the destroyer to come into your house. And so when people were gathered together in that house under the blood, they were protected. Not only does this happen at the beginning of the 40 years in the wilderness, where they were saved by being in the house with the blood, but 40 years later it happens not with the Jews but with the Gentiles. Only those that were in the house of Rahab with a red rope in the window survived when the walls of Jericho fell. They clearly told them. Joshua 2 verse 18. Unless when we come into the land you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down and you bring your father and your mother, your brothers and your father's household into your home. It'll be whoever goes out of the doors of the house into the street, his blood will be on his head. You had to be in the house. We must be in Christ when Jesus comes. If we don't have enough faith to get us to church once a week, you probably don't have enough to get to heaven. If you don't have enough love for the Lord and what's important to Him, to get you to church once a week, you may not have enough love to be qualified to live among the saints. You know, more and more wealthy people are building, because they're worried about society, when they build these expensive houses, they're building what they call safe rooms. And these are rooms that are, you know, reinforced concrete and they're fireproof and they've got electronics inside so if there's a home invasion they can call the police and they've got emergency supplies and food, survive a tornado or some event and others are building bunkers and people are looking for safety. You know, safest place you can be when the end time comes, in the church. I can guarantee you if you are in the church no matter what comes in the world, you are in a safe place. The Bible tells us, that you read Psalm 91, whoever abides under the shadow of the Almighty, thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, only with your eyes will you see and behold the destruction of the wicked. No plague will come near your dwelling. Amen? Don't have to be afraid. You don't want to miss the protection of God. Now I'm not doing these in any particular order, but something else you miss when you miss the church is you miss the pattern of God. What was the pattern of Christ? Luke 4, 16. He came to Nazareth when he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. The word synagogue means the gathering, congregation, assembly, society. It was a church. His pattern was to go to church. Mark 1, 21. Then they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and he taught. Acts 17, 2. Paul, as his custom was, he went into them and for three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, the apostles, Jesus' example, the pattern was the believers came together. It was very important to them to worship. Something else you miss when you miss church, you may be missing the healing power of God. I can think of several examples where the Lord healed. The man let down the roof, not only forgiven, he was healed in the house where Jesus was teaching. Luke 13, verse 10, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years and was bent over and could not raise herself up. But Jesus saw her, said, woman, you are loosed of your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and she glorified God. Then Mark chapter 3 verse 1. He entered the synagogue again and there was a man with a withered hand. And he said, stretch out your hand. And he stretched out and it was restored as whole as the other. These things were happening in the church. There was healing that happened. And I've seen it before where people are coming to worship God and um, during the prayer time something happens and they, they experience some miraculous healing. God does it often when His people are gathered together. Point 11, you miss the peace of God when you miss church. When Jesus went to the disciples and they were gathered in the upper room, you know the first thing He said to them? Peace be with you. By the way, when Jesus says peace be, it's like He says let there be light, it happens. God will give you that peace. His word has power. Now the sad thing, when Jesus met that first night in the upper room with the disciples, they were gathered together, but someone decided to miss church that day. Who was it? Thomas. 
And so when Jesus met, not only did he miss the presence of God, he missed the peace of God for a whole week. The disciples were encouraged. They knew Jesus was alive because they had been there. Thomas missed it. He had another week of doubt and agony because he had missed being there with the others. Luke 24, 33. So they rose up that same hour. They returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together. Now these are two disciples that are down in Emmaus. They, <laughs> Jesus reveals himself to them. They're so excited. What do they do when they find Christ? They go to the church. They go to where the others are gathered together. And they said, the Lord is risen. And now they've gathered. They're talking about Jesus. Guess who appears when they're talking about Jesus? Jesus. And what does he say? Peace be to you. Shalom. God wants to bring peace into your life. Sometimes you hear those words of peace when you come together to worship him in church. And finally, you miss the promise of God when you miss church. John 14, 2, Jesus was gathered in the upper room and he said to them, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. The promise that he will come again was given. Those promises are all repeated in the proclamation. And how many promises? We, we talked about this the other week. In God's word, it is full of exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might become partakers of the divine nature. And when we miss church, we miss the promises that give us the power, they give us confidence, they give us faith, they give us joy. And he doesn't want you to miss that. So, the seven messages in Revelation are given to who? To the churches. And they were to be read in the churches to the people that were ostensibly gathered together in his name. We're living in an age that is the most disconnected age in history. You can have a lot of people that are totally disconnected. Uh, God has called us to be a unit. The Bible says all men will know we are his disciples by our love for one another even though there are some that are not loving. Even though sometimes we may misbehave, there might be cliques, there might be hypocrites, there may be problems. That's just what the devil wants to do to drive you away. In spite of its flaws, he wants us to be committed. He wants us to be committed in our relationship with him and our relationship with each other. There's nothing on earth more important than his church. You know, there's a fascinating story in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is really about the moving of the Holy Spirit with the church. And the last few pages in the book of Acts talk about a storm at sea. All these prisoners are heading for judgment. And Paul intercedes for them. He prays for them. And God spares all the prisoners through the intercession of Paul. Paul's like a type of Christ in this story. And as they're nearing land, it looks like the ship is going to be broken up. And some of the sailors think they're going to abandon ship. They're going to leave everybody else and take the lifeboat. Paul makes this interesting statement. Acts 27, he says to the centurion, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. And now at this point, even though Paul is a prisoner, he's giving orders to everybody on the boat. And the centurion cuts away the lifeboat because they knew that Paul was right, that they had to stick it together they had to stick together to the end. They had to stay in the boat. You know, the reason that you and I are alive is because somebody stayed in the boat called Noah. Everyone here is related to Noah. That was an ark of salvation. And they all made it safely to shore, every single person in that boat, because they stuck together when they were told to. Well, friends, we're entering a storm, I think. It's so important for us to stay together. You know, maybe I'll close with this. I remember reading um, a number of years ago, I, I grew up in New York City, and our governor was Nelson Rockefeller at one point. Um, matter of fact, uh, my mother and her boyfriend and my brother and I almost ran him over during a parade. We didn't know it was a parade. And he was crossing the road, and we tried to get around a barricade. And I remember Bobby telling my mom, uh, we almost ran over Rockefeller. He was walking down the street. You've heard of John D. Rockefeller, multi, multi-millionaire. Well, the great-great-grandson was a young man named Michael Clark Rockefeller. This was Nelson's son, the youngest son. Nelson, of course, also became vice president. And um, Michael was, he was very interested in anthropology. And in his studies, he went to New Guinea. And uh, at one point, he 
and another anthropologist named Rene Watson were in an outrigger canoe with a couple of guides and they were going between islands and their motor died and then the boat got swamped and the boat capsized and they managed to flip it back over and they climbed back in again and and two of the guides said, look, we're going to swim for help. They're, you know, about a mile from shore. So they swam for help. Uh, as the hours went by and the boat kept drifting further and further from the islands, Michael Rockefeller said, you know, I'm just afraid they're going to forget about us. I'm afraid they're not going to come back. He said, I'm going to make for shore myself. And Rene said, don't do it. Stick with the boat. He said, no, we just, they'll, they'll never find us. The ocean's too big. And so what happened is he strapped a couple of empty gas cans on his arms and he tried to swim 12 miles to shore. He was never seen again. The next day, the rescuers picked up Rene in the boat. If he had stayed in the boat, there was a massive, Rockefeller spent millions doing a massive search for his son, never found any trace of what happened to him because he launched out on his own and he should have stuck in the boat. The devil is going to do all he can, friends, in the last days to isolate us, to get us on the fringes so we fall out of the window like Eutychus, or we're overtaken by the Amalekites because we're straggling near the edges. In the last days, we need to be right in the middle of God's will. We need to be part of his church. Amen?